Good evening, everyone. My name is David Harris. I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this screening tonight, uh, brought to us by the New England Innocence Project. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, it is on some level an incredible day, and, and I'm sure we all are processing a great deal of emotion at this point, and um, uh, we, we want to honor that and recognize it as we, uh, as we watch this film and, and, and discuss, uh, discuss its contents afterwards. Um, uh, you know, I'm really pleased to, to have the Houston Institute join the ACLU in co-sponsoring, ACLU of Massachusetts, in co-sponsoring this, uh, this screening and really pleased to be able to be here with you all tonight with Radha Narvatasham and uh, uh, Rasan Hall. Uh, we're going to start the film and I, I have to say before we do so that, that even though there's a, there's a warning at the beginning of the film, the film is incredibly graphic in some regards and contains some some images that especially today might be might be troubling and uh, we encourage any of you who who find it so uh, to to you know leave the room and rejoin us for the conversation uh, you know it's this film itself is filled with with a great deal of detail and sobering statistical information uh, you know, I, I don't really want to say more except that, that, that I'm hopeful that, that all of us uh, find some way to, uh, to maintain our equilibrium as we, as we contemplate the verdict and, and, and our futures. And uh, we hope that today's screening and conversation can be part of that process in crafting the future that we can all share. Uh, you know, I wanted to invite uh, Rasan and Radha to, to give a few remarks before we start the screening. Rasan, you're showing up. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, David and Radha, for uh, the invitation to be a part of this important conversation. And, um, and thank you, David, for the, you know, the, the, the trigger warning and giving people the option to think about whether or not they want to engage with this content. Um, this is um, a very trying time in in this country. Um, that said, it's all it's always been a very trying time uh, in this country, particularly for uh, people of color um, and um, you know, BIPOC folks, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I think it's uh, a conversation, though, nevertheless, that is a very important one um, to have. So even if you feel that you cannot deal with the uh, the images of police violence, um, please tune back in for the conversation at least or revisit the whole session uh, at another time. Thank you all for uh, uh, participating this evening and look forward to uh, a very important conversation. Thank you, Rasan, and thank you, David. Um, we're really grateful at the New England Innocence Project for both of you joining us tonight and um, just being incredible colleagues. Um, and friends um, to us and to me personally. Um, you know, for folks out there, you know, Rasan and David and I have been talking about whether we should go forward with the screening with everything going on, with everything that's happened today, with the, um, with how long we've been holding our breaths and so much more than that. Um, and, we decided to go forward both because, of course, you have a choice to step back and step back in, and we hope um, you'll take that if you need that, and that's important. But also because we can't think that this verdict means justice or that it is the end of police violence or racist policing. We can't think that. Whatever this verdict means to you, to us, and how important it is, it still doesn't mean that we are going to find justice in the courts um, on this. And, I, and, and this film is such a powerful testament to how long, basically forever, we have been contending. And so I, I hope that you will see this in the spirit of that we are not trying to add on to the racial exhaustion 
that so many of us feel and the trauma. Um, but we also want us to be together, process this, and also think about a future that doesn't feel like this. So that's hopefully what we're gonna do today. And we're really grateful to have everyone here. With that, um, David, are you ready for me to- uh, I think we should roll the film. All right. Thank you all for being here. misconception about misdemeanors is that they are my friend. To start hearing more and more stories of voter suppression, it broke my heart. They're the ones that are using the system. My grandma was fighting for integration back in her day, and I'm fighting for the same thing now. The problem is the system is working the way it's supposed to. We're recording. Sorry. Sometimes I feel like my life ended that day. My car died on the side of the road. A cop walked over to my car and asked me if I needed help. And I said no. John Clark was convicted on a misdemeanor gambling charge and was forced to work on a chain gang. I just remember being pushed, like being cornered into a wall. I was just starting out life. And I didn't think I had anything to hide. Mary Gay was sentenced to 30 days, plus court costs for stealing a hat. I was arrested that evening. It was a misdemeanor. That was the beginning of the nightmare that I had to go through. Henry Nelson was arrested for using abusive language in the presence of a female and was sent off to the coal mines. You say you're going to jail. And I'm like, what for? Misdemeanors have historically been the chump change crimes that we didn't pay attention to. I've done nothing. I've done nothing. I just got beat up by the police last night. I could have lost my life. 13 million. That's about 80% of all American criminal dockets. 80% of what our criminal courts do is misdemeanors. The story of misdemeanors is the story of law enforcement continuing to prioritize African Americans, Mexican immigrants, America's so called criminal class. You act like I really just committed a serious crime. You did do something illegal. You crossed the crosswalk. You might see two or three police standing here waiting for you. Cops would jump out of the van anytime, anywhere. The misdemeanor system has not gotten its fair share of blame. Misdemeanors are the invidious first step in the racialization of crime in this country. Too often, arrests for minor crimes devolve into police violence and death for black and brown people. <laughs> How far back that goes is a really dark story.
Reconstruction was an era when 4 million African Americans made it out of bondage and were able to achieve at really high levels. Whether it was in business, um, in, in education, um, different ways of prosperity that really threatened white supremacy. They elected many black men to positions of power. Of course, that was a sea change from how power had been exercised during slavery. And a lot of white folks just didn't like it. They were nostalgic for the old days of overt white supremacy. And so they subverted reconstruction. If you look at misdemeanors and you track them from the Reconstruction era to modern day, you see the fingerprints everywhere of white supremacy and control of black bodies. The Bland owners, they had nearly lost everything. And the only way to get that back is to somehow corral the black labor force back onto the same plantations that they had once worked. The most effective way of forcing African Americans back into this condition that would be so similar to slavery was to begin to criminalize black life itself. Misdemeanor offenses for incredibly trivial or made up things, what should have been tiny penalties for non-existent offenses, turn into years of people's lives. Where were you taken? I was taken out to the camps. Where did you sleep? Slept on some hay. Chain was on me. I'm being put into handcuffs. I'm being dragged into this cold space. I don't have anything to cover myself. And I'm asked to sit inside of this tiny little room and I have no idea why I'm there. Was there any jury that tried you? No, sir. Did the recorder ask you whether you wanted a lawyer? No, sir. And I thought that I would have time to talk to a court appointed attorney so we could talk about what happened. And I can ask them to get other you know, pieces of evidence that would prove that, hey, I'm poor. It wasn't like I was trying to run off with this money. Did they furnish any copy of the charge against you? No, sir, they did not. Did they give you any opportunity to plead to any accusation? They never gave me anything at all. When they asked me how I pled, I pled no contest. I didn't understand that no contest is the same as guilty and that I would walk away with a misdemeanor that would affect my ability to get hired. The justice system after emancipation was weaponized against black people. It perpetuated slavery by making the mechanisms of enslavement pretty much the same. Family separation, backbreaking labor, people having no rights. You could be sold on the steps of the courthouse that you were convicted in and given to the highest bidder. A whole separate criminal code that applied to African Americans was established. Many misdemeanor offenses are best understood as mechanisms of social control. They're not designed to catch dangerous or guilty people, but rather they are tools. We give them to police as additional ways of exercising their authority. Some of these laws were overtly race-based. And with others, then and now, the understanding was that the laws would look race-neutral, but they would be applied and enforced almost exclusively against Black people. For these governments to sell prisoners into slavery, you first have to arrest lots of people. There's a big problem with that, though. There's just not enough crime for this system to work and for it to be profitable. The state governments of the South had to invent new crimes. Southern legislatures, which are essentially run by Confederates at that time, are trying to reinscribe a form of slavery through a system of laws called Black Codes. A whole category of new statutes passed in almost every southern state that attached these enormous penalties to what were in reality very minor thefts. Those were laws and many others like it that were only ever enforced against African Americans. And so it became a way to have a basis for arresting huge numbers of black people. I don't remember much about writing the check. 
John Owen was caught taking six years of corn from a cornfield and was arrested under the black codes. This is four dollars and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times four is twenty-eight dollars. So just this pile right here is how much I went to jail for. Owen was put in jail for months until he was finally tried for theft. I have a theft charge, it's theft by check. I had money in the bank, but I didn't know how long it took for checks to process. Like I know better now. I could have donated plasma. $25. Under his sentence, Owen was leased in the convict labor and sent to the chain gang where he served two years for the corn and a third year for the court costs. I was in the Hayes County Jail for a total of 45 days for $25 worth of food. Michael Brown, who was the teenager who was killed by police in Ferguson, whose death led to the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement, he was stopped for jaywalking. He stepped off the sidewalk and was walking in the street and there was a local criminal ordinance that made it a crime to do so. African Americans are being cited for jaywalking at three, five, ten times the rate of white pedestrians. The legislatures of the white south make it a crime to walk alongside a railroad in an era in which there are no paved roads. The easiest way for a poor person to get from one place to another is to walk alongside a railroad. That law didn't say this only applies to black people, but those were laws that were only ever enforced against African-Americans. All of us engage in what would be considered to be minor crimes. And for some people, it's crossing the street at the wrong time. But if you're black or brown, then it becomes categorized as something that's criminal. So what are you doing? Did it use a crosswalk? All I'm trying to do is go home, man. I'm tired. I just got home from work. Nandi King says he was walking home from work when it happened. Because I felt like they were going to draw a gun out and shoot me in my back. I'm tired of all this shit, man. Vagrancy laws were passed that essentially meant any black person who was found on the streets unemployed and couldn't show evidence of work was a criminal, a vagrant. Trespass laws originate from this idea that African Americans only belong in certain spaces and at certain times. And so they give police officers the ability under the guise of law to dictate where an African American person can be, what time they can be there, and how they can operate in certain spaces. My kids' daycare was inside of one of the buildings to the um, Skyway, so I figured I'd take a walk, find somewhere to sit down, and um, wait on them to get there. I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids. I was sitting there for 10 minutes. That's when Rodolphus was standing in the train yard when he was grabbed by the sheriff's deputy. Monroe stated that he had not committed any crime. Hey, you ain't going to go to jail. I'm not doing anything yeah. wrong. Hold on, honey. Can you hold on, please? Not, no, no, come on, brother. No, 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 this is assault. At this moment, I saw my children's daycare class and their teachers and everything um, walking past while this was happening. He took the taser and drove it into my leg. And pretty much at that point, it lost all control of the leg. The deputy later claimed that the crime committed by Dolphus was taking a 25 cent tin of fish from the lunch pail of a Southern railway worker. Unable to provide any evidence to support this, the charge was changed to vagrancy. And I kept asking them what I was being charged with. They'll create false charges just to make sure that everything is perpetuated. Judge Longshore found Dolphus guilty of misdemeanor vagrancy and sentenced him to five months and 20 days of hard labor in the mines of Tennessee, Coal, Iron, and Railroad. Going back to the vagrancy laws of the late 19th century, the people who make those laws have in mind another group of people for whom there is an inherent threat to their livelihood, like breaking barbecue ordinances in public parks or sleeping in dormitories that white people don't think you live there. It allows law enforcement to regulate whether or not certain behavior 
for one group of people is deemed uh, criminal and another group of people uh, is just frivolous activity. Many people remember the Starbucks debacle in Philadelphia. There were two African-American men at a Starbucks. The employee had them arrested for loitering where they're clearly not engaging in that behavior. Loitering is a police tool of choice. It's the go-to offense that police often use to impose their authority. In the misdemeanor system, there is no conduct too minor, no act too small that the state cannot render a crime. Black people charged with a misdemeanor are 75% more likely to be locked up than white people. You have to realize that these laws didn't happen by chance. They were part of a, uh, a system to continue to oppress black bodies. Our misdemeanor system includes all kinds of offenses and some of them can be quite serious. Domestic violence, DUI, but most of the time we treat minor harmless conduct as misdemeanors, traffic offenses, jaywalking, order maintenance offenses, spitting, driving on a suspended license for failure to pay a fine. And yet these minor meaningless misdemeanors can have terrible consequences for individuals. <laughs> To understand the misdemeanor system, follow the money. The accused are paying for the judges, the prosecutors, and the public defenders. more than three and a half million dollars off the commissary at the jail. It's a no money matter. The twenty dollar. Time a family member transfers money. Pocketing leftover money from the inmates about two thousand dollars a month. They are a controversial food factory. The big fraud, waste, and abuse. Air market. The company that uses inmate workers. Today's system is estimated at $80 billion. The misdemeanor side of it, it is a way of saddling people with fines and fees that will put money in the pockets of the administrators of that system. The first time I got a ticket, my insurance had lapsed. So I got the speeding ticket and I got a no insurance ticket at the same time. The next time I got pulled over, I was arrested for driving with a suspended license. I paid the tickets, paid the court costs, paid my fees and fines, but they said for driving with a suspended license, the punishment for that is we're going to suspend your license for two years. I would often have to choose between paying my inspection or my registration or paying my light bill or other bills that I had. I had to drive my car to get to work because I had a construction job. If I needed to take material to the job, I couldn't take plywood or two by fours on a bus. I felt like there was no way I was gonna be able to take care of the kids on my own while you were out, because I didn't know how long you were gonna be in jail. This officer saw me, a young Hispanic guy, driving a 63 Impala and said, you know what, that guy, he's up to something. I was trying to go to work, trying to pay bills, and he's treating me like a hardened criminal. That misdemeanor charge ended up becoming something that I couldn't get rid of. They are being treated as revenue sources charged daily fees for being in jail, supervision fees, tether fees, drug testing fees, database fees to fund bail bondsmen, private probation companies, electronic monitoring companies, drug testing companies. It is disturbingly similar to the way that we saw African-Americans being exploited in the post-war South. I'm Demario Davis, uh, linebacker for the New Orleans Saints. I was born and raised in Mississippi, pretty much raised by a single mom. Entering into my second year of college, me and a teammate were caught shoplifting groceries from, from Walmart. 
it kind of felt a lot more like a drug bust than uh, <laughs> um, us having stole some groceries. The bail was set at ten thousand dollars, and you know, I didn't have ten thousand dollars. The football coaches bailed us out. A misdemeanor, you're supposed to be able to uh, be in front of the judge within 90 days. But this is not happening. This is not happening in our country. We have people who are spending seven, eight months in jail who have not even been sentenced. Cop arrested me and I was charged with the misdemeanor. The term chain gang was coined on account of the shackle worn by convict laborers. They said, okay, listen, we're going to let you go home now. But Scram's going to come and uh, put a monitor on you. They were taken to an anvil where a rivet was pounded into the ankle cuffs to keep them closed. Then the cuffs were chained together. The initial fee to get on the Scram was $250. That's just to have it put on. Then after that, they charged me $220 a month for the actual monitor. Many of the convicts suffered from shackle sores, ulcers where the iron ground against their skin. Gangrene and other infections were also common. Right after they put it on me, they start causing these really severe sores and rashes. And their attitude pretty much is, it's court ordered, it's by a judge, and you're aware it, or you can go back to jail. The emaciated convict laborers worked their entire days barefoot, but the shackles were always on their ankles. They mined in them, slept in them, and those who died of disease or beatings were buried in them. What they're doing is unjust. What they're doing is profiteering because you, you're paying them. You're their slave with their shackle on your foot. this hopeless feeling just overcome me. I couldn't take care of my family. The biggest misconception about misdemeanors is that they are minor. The full consequences of getting a misdemeanor can be astronomical. It hurt me for 10 years and it completely disrupted my life. And I have been trying to figure out how to get my life back on track. This will be a part of my story for the rest of my life. When people are booked into jails for a week or a year or even a day, you just cannot avoid the trauma that's inflicted upon you. The moment you hit the jail, you don't come out of that unchanged or untouched. You witness trauma, you witness violence, and it changes you. It changes your community. I tried to get a job at Amazon where my roommate worked. I called to Walmart and I called to several other retail stores. I got turned away because I had a misdemeanor charge for theft. Not enough people talk about what it means to have a misdemeanor on your record. It can determine the kind of job that you get, to the kind of housing that you can qualify for, to the kind of schools that you can go to. A lot of people are harmed for life because of the smallest infractions. They're being rendered homeless. They're going without food, without medication. Their children are suffering. Due to misdemeanors, I lost my housing. Shortly after that, I lost my vehicle, which led to me losing my job. And it was just one thing after another, like, like kicks to the face. I had full custody of my children. They had to get to school. We had to sleep in the car, waking up at like four in the morning, getting to a laundromat to make sure that they have clean school uniforms. And worked so hard and all of that was ruined by one charge. One misdemeanor ruined my ability to get even just basic work. They can't get a job if they have to check a box that says they've been convicted of a crime. They can't even rent housing because they got poor credit when they received a ridiculous $500 speeding violation. So this system was designed both to extract from people, but also to marginalize their presence in society. 
It's gonna be a mass grave site. This is the dormitory. The stupid crowd of bees on the bed, they right beside each other, and this is the space. Everybody just dying and getting sick and shit. Like, this shit serious as fuck. Bro, you all right? Mm -hmm. You want me to go get the police? No. What have you done, this bitch? You ain't gonna do nothing, bro. This motherfucker literally in this bitch dying, bro. I don't know what to do. One of the worst places to be during this pandemic is locked up in jail. The judge never said it. I'm sending you to prison to die. Same horror story is emerging of the unchecked spread of infection and inmates essentially being left to die. Now jaywalking or theft of a small amount or any sort of vagrancy type of um, behavior can lead to your incarceration and eventual contracting of the virus and death. I've been in jail for two and a half months for a petty theft, a nonviolent crime that carries a misdemeanor charge for the price value of uh, less than a hundred dollars. There's been three deaths, two being inmates, one being a guard. As far as like people who are working for the facility, they're like intertwined. They could easily be catching it. It's how one of the guards caught it. My life is in danger. These human beings aren't valued enough for us to apply the same kinds of safety measures there that we are in other sectors of society. If it wasn't already bad enough that you are booked into jail because you didn't have the money to pay the ticket and your license is suspended, that is now life-threatening to you. Sheriff's Office is now releasing non-violent inmates as a next step in mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Hundreds of inmates have been released from Shelby County's jail in an effort to put fewer people at risk for coronavirus. Inmates a total inmates of 38 inmates are ordered to jail. Now they're free people. Because of COVID-19, thousands of misdemeanor defendants are rightly being released. It's clear that these individuals should have never been incarcerated in the first place. Um, we can tell by the fact that after these releases, we haven't seen any sort of crime wave. There's a different type of crime wave that should concern us though, and that's the crime of violence against black people post-Civil War. State violence has historically been used to intimidate people of color, especially black people. We see this all throughout history. Misdemeanors, they have almost nothing to do with public safety. What misdemeanors do is give police an extraordinary amount of discretion with any minor offense premised on the idea that the black man is a threat. Misdemeanors are a very specific mechanism that legalize violence toward black people and keep them in a very particular place, not just as individuals, but as an entire community of people. When we look at so many cases in history, often what started as an investigation or a claim of a petty misdemeanor offense led to police officers supported and sanctioned racial terrorism. All too often we see police exercising that terrible authority of violence against people who have only been suspected of the most minor of crimes. The problem isn't bad apple cops. The problem is the system is working the way it's supposed to. Police shot this boy outside my apartment. <laughs> they kill him. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. 
Gray appeared to be unable to walk and was screaming as he was carried, feet dragging on the ground, to a police van. I know, I know, you just saw your job. So easily been taken in that skyway. George Floyd goes to show further that the most minor of offenses, even no offense at all, could result in death. The very purpose of racial terrorism is control, is social control. What we have seen in the killings of those accused was that misdemeanors became the gateway for police violence and murder. We are seeing decriminalization. We are seeing citations instead of arrests. We are seeing people let out of jail. We are seeing pushback against fines and fees. But at the same time, there is so much more work that needs to be done. Who defined what a misdemeanor is? The whole thing was built on exploitation, on racial violence, on building up industrial capitalism. We should not be locking up people who speed, who are too poor to pay a fine or a fee, who loiter or trespass or jaywalk. They're not dangerous. They're not scary. There's never been a good reason to lock up anybody for petty offenses. Like slavery back in the day, the law itself is doing the work of oppression. The criminal law is providing the authority to arrest Black people, to punish Black people, to kill Black people. And ultimately, the real crime is that we're Black. You know, I think probably we all need a, a moment to sit, you know, just absorb a little bit.
Uh, you know, I know when when we when when we scheduled this and and, and the days leading up to it, you know, I think we knew that that the verdict was going to come at some point. I don't know that we anticipated it would come today. And I think, you know, in our conversations earlier, we thought about whether that's a mixed, you know, what it meant for us and for this conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I still, I really have the same kind of opening question I'd like to ask both of you, which is, um, Kind of where where it leaves you. What do we where what do we what do we take away, and how do we make sense of 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 what we've just seen? I mean, I know that's a that's an almost impossible question, but you know, what are some of the thoughts that you have to to share with viewers about the importance of this film? Either one of you. Um, uh, it, it, it leaves me resolute in the need to abolish police. Um, it leaves me recommitted to the work of, of narrative shift, um, helping people understand the roots of the system of oppression and how this uninterrupted thread runs from slavery through mass incarceration. And it's unfortunate that it's events like these, um, these police killings uh, that have captured headlines and have led people to the streets um, are the things that really begin to shift the public conversation about the problem uh, of policing. It makes it harder to defend the institution of policing when people have a comprehensive understanding of, of how it is executed in a racialized way. Um, you know, um, but I'm also left grieving uh, because I, I think of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people whose lives have been disrupted, derailed, destroyed, um, or deleted because of not only the institution of policing and its uh, in, inherent embedded racism, um, its toxic masculinity, its perpetuation of predatory capitalism or maintenance of that system, uh, but, but particularly the, the, the policing of these low level offenses, these misdemeanors, the tool in the tool belt of law enforcement that allows them to, to exercise the grant that we have given them, which is the ability to take liberty and in some instances life. Um, and, and to use it without any uh, regard for the long-term effects. And as a former prosecutor, having been complicit in that, charging people um, with, with these offenses, using those offenses and, uh, and, and holding people on bail, leveraging guilty pleas, bargaining away uh, those lower level offenses to get the conviction on on something else uh, and how people's lives have been impacted um, by that. So it's a, it's a range of, uh, of emotions and feelings that I, I come away from this documentary uh, with, uh, particularly in a moment like this. Thank you, Rasan. Um, I think my first thought was really about this narrative shift. It is, you know, this film, which is only 35 minutes, is such a powerful catalog of our history. And it's so, and it's so clear in that history. And, you know, we, you, know, you Rasan and I, we have been working in the criminal legal system for many years. 
And we have seen that. And yet the narrative, the public narrative around policing couldn't be more different from the picture in this documentary. It's about someone putting their lives on the line for us. It is, um, we should be so grateful to the sacrifice that is being made in our name. And I think this film is, um, is, is it's important for those of us who's here, I think to begin this process of the narrative shift because policing, how it's talked about, how it's funded and everything else about it that makes police officers invincible and heroic, it whitewashes the reality, the history, the truth, and it's our responsibility, I think, to begin moving that. And, and one of the pieces that I think is so important, and this is why I am grateful to be here on the day of this verdict, is that something like this, that from slavery to today, the straight line that hasn't wavered, it has simply, uh, looked a little bit different, but is quite a straight line that it doesn't take, a verdict doesn't change that. It doesn't, you know, we, we are talking about, there are no simple solutions to this. And I think that's what we really um, have to be together in, you know, it is, it is only with collective power that we can change something this big, um, and we must. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as, as I was watching it, I was thinking, you know, the, 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 the context of the film is misdemeanors, right? It's a category of crime, so-called, right? Transgressions. Uh, but the film is, as you both have said, about policing. And, you know, one of the things is that whatever happened today happened to an individual and not to the institution of policing. And we might take some comfort that there's some degree of, of justice wrought, you know, for George Floyd. Uh, but what's, what's most clear, I think, about this film is the, the continued excess of the role of policing as what is described in the film as social control. Um, you know, I, you know, one of the things I was, I thought about, you know, in terms of the film is, you know, that uh, this guy Douglas Blackman is, is featured in the film. And Douglas Blackman's book came out in 2008, right? Slavery by another name. And, uh, and, you know, the, the question, you know, really the question we have to ask of ourselves is how much data do we need? How many examples do we need? How do we, Rasan, uh, move toward that? So, so that the question uh, or, 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 or of, of abolition, right? How do we change the narrative in a way that we don't have to have another film like this in five years and, you know, reminders of this history, which, which we really have known for a while, right? I mean, I think that's, I think that's, that's the conundrum really. Do, do we think this, this opens the door for that narrative shift? And it, it's hard to say, David. I mean, you know, for some, for some folks, you know, a film like this might, provoke that moment of cognitive dissonance where they're trying to make sense of the information that's being presented to them that is in stark conflict with the uh, their understanding uh, of of police and and but I, I I think that's just a small handful of people maybe it's more right the circles I travel in probably have have, have biased me in in that way uh, uh, 
the challenge is is getting to the the heart of you know, human psychology and 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 how we are socialized. And one of the greatest motivators uh, that we have is fear, hmm. right? It's that it's that primordial nature in us that if something scares us, it's going to provoke us to action, as opposed to whether something inspires us. We we may be moved. Um, and, and I think that's the challenge that we're up against when we talk about abolition, because part of the work, in addition to decon dismantling this system of oppression, is casting a vision of a world that we want to live in, where people uh, people's needs are met and they can live healthy and fulfilled lives. Um, but as, as inspirational as that may sound, it's not the same type of motivator as fear is. And it's easy to, to, to run a series of news reports of burglaries and random shootings and child abductions and gang violence when the overwhelming majority of interactions that human beings have in this country, that barely registers. But that's what makes it newsworthy and it further embeds in our mind that there is danger out there. And that danger makes us look for a solution or protection. And the only thing that we've ever been presented with is either arming ourselves or calling the police. And and the and the role of police and the and the and and nine one one in particular uh, has exacerbated and, and weaponized racial biases and and we see this all the time, right? Folks using nine one one like it's customer service. I have a concern about this person who parked in front of my building. There's somebody walking down the street who looks out of place. That's not to discount the actual threats and harm that's happening in society and the need to respond to those, but the amount of coverage that those things get compared to the reality of what police get called for and what they engage the citizenry about is wildly out of proportion. And, you know, I, I just don't know um, how we how we overcome that. I'm going to fight like hell to make sure um, that happens and and things like this begin to force people to reckon with the problems of the institution as it is, but it's still not in the proper perspective of law enforcement or the enforcement of laws writ large throughout the country. And I think a right sizing of the problem of so-called crime versus the investment that we've made in the alleged solution is probably going to begin to shift that conversation as well. Rather, do you have do you have thoughts on that? Uh, how we do this? I mean, I think just to pick it, to, to comment on one thing you said, Rasan. I mean, I think uh, you know the question is who's afraid and of what? Uh, because one of the things that's very clear in the film is that black people and people of color have cause to be afraid of the police. And there's, there, there is real legitimate fear there. And so the question is, how do you register the, the, uh, the legitimacy of that fear, you know, in, you know, in, in, in relation to the fear that you're discussing? So, so rather, I'm sorry, I don't know. I mean, if you have thoughts on kind of how we, we move this narrative in a way that that maybe centers the, the fear that we have. Uh, I want to respond um, a little bit to what Rasan was saying too, but I think it, it comes to this. But I think first we have to understand um, understand what we're dealing with before we can talk about where we can move from here. And so, you know, Rasan mentioned psychology and, and fear. Um, I will also mention, you know, American exceptionalism and romanticism. And because I think that, you know, white supremacy is, um, that is not uh, exceptionally American, but the way it is in America is different and the way we see policing, but also the way we think of ourselves. 
Americans want to feel pride. They want to, they love Disney. They love the happy ending. They love the simplistic uh, storyline where somebody is the hero. And when you mix that kind of simplicity, that kind of pride with white supremacy in the way we have it here, you have a really difficult way to, um, for people to accept that things are rotten to the core. People do not want to see that. And if you look, for example, at um, just how we responded to the pandemic and, and, mm. and, you know, still, you know, there is a, there is a denialism, a dissonance between, you know, this is the magical world and everything is, you know, beautiful. And we are not going to believe that we are the people who, uh, who, who enslaved people and who continue to enslave people. We're not going to believe that about ourselves. So we have to tell ourselves that we are doing something different. And that goes to the fear, because if we believe that what we're doing is noble and we are creating safety, if we believe that narrative, then all the money and the investment in policing makes sense. But if what we're doing is creating violence and we are you know, just sustaining white supremacy, then what we have been doing has been a waste. And I don't think that people in America want to think about themselves like that. Yeah, I mean, and rather it does, it does raise the question about whose safety is at stake, right? Even in that conversation. But I mean, as in speaking of exceptionalism, and one of the things I think, you know, I'm curious about is that, that people in Massachusetts think of Massachusetts as Boston and as being immune from these things. You know, I mean, we have our own history with Chuck Stewart and ACLU studies and, you know, the history of racial profiling. And we think that that Boston doesn't suffer from these policing woes and that somehow, uh, even though our, our Supreme Judicial Court has started to see otherwise, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I wonder, you know, if you all have thoughts about, you know, the, the recent sweeping police. I mean, we had last year, you know, the the legislature uh, brought out the broom and gave us sweeping uh, police reform. Um, and, um, you know, and I, and, I, and I wonder kind of what your thoughts are on that that legislation and 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 if you you know you know how do we if we have questions about it how do we i mean that was that that legislation was passed you know in, in fact allegedly in response to the murder of george floyd yeah um you know i i think first like yes it it, it does in fact um happen here um, and, you know, at the ACLU, we did in the midst of this legislative campaign, launched a site, uh, police violence app in here is to, to pinpoint the locations um, where police violence happened. I mean, we, we need no look no further um, than, you know, the, the drug laboratory scandal mm -hmm. or, you know, the case of, of Sean Ellis um, and, and his uh, wrongful conviction or any number of people uh, who the Innocence Project has has helped uh, to be exonerated or those that they, they couldn't get to um, who are still uh, wrongfully convicted. I, I think, and, and, it's, and, and the roots of this problem, separate and apart from the societal issues around structural racism, white supremacy, et cetera, um, begin with policing and the way that policing happens in community. And to the extent that this was sweeping um, uh, police reform legislation, uh, if this was the way I swept my kitchen as, uh, as a child, I would have gotten a whooping for it. So it touched every part of the kitchen, <laughs> but I didn't get up the dirt. Um, and so I, I, I say that, um, you know, to, 
while at the same time acknowledging that there that there were some significant strides um, there, but but I'm conflicted about some of them. The the centerpiece of this bill was the creation of a post commission, a police or a peace officer standards and training commission that sets the standards for policing and for police training. It certifies police officers, but more importantly, it has the ability to decertify them and can conduct investigations into police departments um, and keep a registry of decertified officers. So a bad officer can't go from one department to the next. Those are all uh, good things. But at the same time, while doing that, it further cements the presence of police because now we've certified them and we've given them the seal of approval of the state. Um, you know, it, it, it tries to regulate face surveillance. It barely touches qualified immunity. It did put in some place, some, uh, some reforms to, the, to use of force um, standards uh, to prevent chokeholds, to limit the use of no-knock warrants, um, to put some limits on kinetic impact weapons or rubber bullets and chemical uh, chemical crowd control uh, weapons, uh, but none of those things are going to get to the heart of the problem of policing, which is we use this blunt object to address all of the societal ills that they are not equipped to address, and it's too draconian uh, of a of a remedy to the extent that that's how we're looking at it um, to to address people's underlying. Um, needs and then if you filter on top of that uh, the, the the biases um, and the problematic behavior of the officers uh, who have been uh, empowered with the ability to enforce the laws uh, that is only exacerbated particularly in poor communities and communities uh, of color and then there's a ton of study commissions to study the things that we already been telling folks <laughs> need to be changed, but now we're going to have some data behind it and some recommendations from a panel of experts that the legislature may or may not embrace or uh, or adopt. So on one level, it's kind of like busy work. On another level, it's in some respects harm reduction because it uh, attempts to limit the, the impact of the harm that uh, that police are engaged in. Um, but it's, a, it's one step in a long journey uh, to uh, dramatically um, um, uh, reducing the footprint uh, of police. Rather, did you have thoughts on either kind of the, the, the Massachusetts exceptionalism or on our on our uh, the legislation that we had last last year? Commissions are not a response to murder, to state violence, or white supremacy. That is bottom line. Commissions are not the response. We don't need more studies. We don't need more data. And if anything, commissions create complacency. So the question is, in this laundry list of some things, is there anything there that is going to reduce the presence of police or just create more scaffolding so that people feel better, that they feel like they are doing something when they're not? It is, um, it is again, it is it is magical thinking. It is a solution that is not at all uh, fitting to what we're seeing here. Um, you know, you see this film, and if you come away with this by saying, let's form a commission, then we watch something different. You know, if you live your life, you know, in the watching what's happening in the criminal legal system, and I, for all of you, you know, when it's safe to do so, please go to court and see what is mm -hmm. happening in your name, it is, um, a commission is not the response. What I want to know is by how, by how many percentage points is every single municipality in Massachusetts and the state for the state police cutting their police budget? That's what I want to know. That's harm reduction to me. It's not, it's not a study. We, we know this. Mm -hmm. We know what the problem is. We know what the solution is. And this is just, um, it's telling us, but just, you know, just keep waiting for justice. Just keep waiting for justice. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't be anything but skeptical. And I would love to be proven wrong about these reforms that we've seen. I would love that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I have said all along, I and, and in watching this film, I, I missed the placard that said, no new commissions, no peace, right? I mean, that, that's not what people were on the street about, right? I, I, maybe it was, maybe someone had that sign, but, uh, and and the fact is that, that <laughs> sorry, come on, I'm sorry, you've heard me say that before. Uh, it's great, um, though, I love it. Well, well, it's true, I mean, and it's painful. I mean, I mean, I think it really, you know, and, and, and as we know, I mean, you know, people have been killed by, by chokeholds where chokeholds are illegal. Chokeholds, you know, chokeholds by definition are illegal in many places. Many places with post commissions continue to have people killed by police. I mean, uh, but I do want to think a, a, a minute about this question of, 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 of funding, right? Because, uh, you know, on some level, I think part of our conversation points to the fact that policing is part of a system of social control. It's part of a structure of white supremacy um, that, you know, to my mind, uh, actually continues to reflect Justice Taney's insistence that a black person has no rights that a white person, certainly not a white police officer, has an obligation to uh, respect. And to me, the, qu the question I have is, is, is how do we distinguish between, you know, taking some money away and changing the structure, right? I mean, and does, uh, does you know, we see now in Boston this debate over whether or not, you know, can we, the, the police overtime, I mean, you know, the, the money was spent anyway, right? Um, and and so I, I do, I am curious to hear your thoughts on, 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 uh, on how you know, you know how it works in terms of taking money away. I, I mean, I agree with you, but uh, in in a way, is that is that enough, right? I mean, does that does that change the structure of policing, or change, or, or simply change its reach in, in some ways? I'll start on this one. I mean, in a in a capitalistic society a really capitalist society, um, money does, taking away money does a lot. Um, I don't even think we should underestimate the impact that could have. Um, so I, I think it is a good starting point. Is it the end of the end? No. But it's a better starting point than actually where we're starting. And one of the places, if you think about misdemeanors, and there was a question um, in the Q&A about who decides you know, the misdemeanors, well, you know, all of these laws are in our books, meaning the legislature has passed them. Every year, there are laws that are passed that create more laws, more criminal laws, more criminal penalties, uh, mandatory minimum. Uh, it creates all of these misdemeanors are embedded in our criminal code. So who creates them? First, we do, because we elected people. Then created these laws and what we need if money as a starting point is you can get rid of the law that's also people driven things put into law can be taken out of law people decide budgets we elect people who are voting on budgets and um we can we can make it so that the uh to the extent that there is money at all, to the extent that there is a structure there, that it's not used, um, we take away the tools that allow it to be used for social control, at least reducing that. Because if you don't have this many police officers, if you don't have this many laws, if you don't have the excuse of they broke a law, so I'm going to enforce it. Um, these are excuses that only exist because of the amount of money and resources we have put into the institution. So, you know, who created these things? We did. Who can get rid of them? We can, but uh, it has to be through collective action. There's no other way. It is not through, um, it's not through hoping that somebody in power is going to make a decision um, this way. It's, it's on us. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I think, and, and that's the fresh, 
the frustrating part, and rather I want to come back to the point that you've made about what's being done in our names. What what hap what the police do, what the lawmakers do who make the laws, what the police do who execute those laws, as well as prosecutors and even judges. It's all being done in our name. It is the Commonwealth. As a prosecutor, I stood up on cases and said, Commonwealth, I am here representing the Commonwealth. When victims of crimes did not want to go forward because it was a family member that was accused with a crime, I, as the prosecutor, had the power to go forward irrespective of their desires because I was representing the interests of the Commonwealth. And so as long as the Commonwealth is made up of um, you know, people who have a desire to want to be made safe from whatever number of boogeymans exist out there, these types of harms are going to start uh, or are going to continue to happen. It's it's where, you know, but now there's a possibility, um, you know, the, the window of discourse has shifted such that the conversation around defunding the police is, is something that is engaged with. Um, whereas before, you couldn't even have that conversation. So now, um, there's some momentum behind that. We're still a long way off, but it's not just defunding the police either because right. that's not going to, to do it. And the amount of money that's spent on policing, it could certainly do a lot to address some of the ills in society, whether it's around education, whether it's around youth violence intervention, whether it's around mental health issues or substance use disorder, but it is a far cry from what we actually need to make sure communities are made whole. And David, you've made this point time and time again, we've got to try to get away from like, let's just take it from the police and give it to these things because that ain't gonna be enough to really. And, and so, and therein lies the problem because when, when people start defunding police and shifting that money to social workers and to education programs, and we're still seeing disruption in community, they're gonna say, there's gonna be folks who are gonna say, well, see, we told you it wasn't gonna work. Look at the crime rates have gone up. Look at all these people who got shot or harmed because you wanted to defund the police. But nobody's ever really addressed and took a made a commitment in addressing uh, the the deep underlying issues, and therefore the justification that we will always need the police uh, has resonance because people can't conceptualize a world in which we actually fund the things that we need to fund so people can live healthy and whole lives. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, you know, right. So, I mean, it's, I mean, if I, if I may, I mean, I do think, <clears throat> the, you know. One of the question, you know, we're begging the question of when we say we can change this, who is we, right? Uh, and you know, I, I would suggest, you know, so you know, when when we passed the three strikes legislation, uh, however long ago that was, every every elected official of color voted against it. it wasn't enough. <laughs> we 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 got it anyway, and and so so one of the you know so. The question of who we, I think you, I, I absolutely agree, Rather, you know, the kind of, there, there's a question of political will and, and political power. And that's what it's so kind of how do we, and, and that sweeping reform bill w w was passed in, in, in our name also, right? Uh, and so, you know, one of the questions I think we face is how do we expand the base of those who we can line up? to push for the kind of change we're talking about, right? Um, and as Rassan says, you know, I have been arguing for quite some time that, that, that there are two separate issues. There's a question of taking money away from the police to possibly reduce the harm that they can do. But, the, but, but there's also the, the, the need, you know, if we can come up with trillions of dollars, you know, at the drop of a hat for, for certain kinds of relief, then we need to be able to come up with that money to address the social determinants of health that are going to make our communities whole and safe and, uh, instead of the police. Uh, but how we do that, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, how we, we mobilize the political will beyond those of us who are doing <laughs> this work. Uh, <laughs> you know, as Alex Stevenson said, when he was said, you know, Mr. Governor, you know, you're the smartest man in the race. He said, yes, but I need a majority. 
uh, uh, he said, every, every, every intelligent person, every intelligent voter is going to vote for you. And he said, yes, but I need a majority. And, uh, you know, I think, I, I don't know how, how we get there. Um, I think one of the important things is that mobilization is critical, but who is leading the mobilization is also important. And that is because if people who are impacted are not leading the mobilization, there will be compromises in policy that allow things to happen in the name of progress, in the name of reform. Um, there are, and, and what that ends up doing is having, you know, organizations, uh, you know, sort of fighting each other for who's going to get a win um and who's gonna claim victory and who's gonna get the money and you know again it's like we're talking about uh the capital the capitalism that fuels even the pro even fuels the people who are uh working toward change and i think that if the people who are the most impacted are the ones to, to make the determination to lead on what compromises are okay and in what circumstances something is not better than nothing. In what circumstances do we say, no, we don't need to pass something in George Floyd's name today because what I want is for there not to be a George Floyd tomorrow, right? And so I think that there, um, those compromises that we have become so accustomed to um, is something that we have to be less accustomed. We have to we have to say no. We're going to hold out for what is justice because we deserve that. It's been too long. So I, I think I think there has to be a seeding of power and then a mobilization behind people who uh, feel the impact of these compromises. Yeah. I, I, I echo everything Rather just said. I, I also think somebody needs to get out and start mobilizing poor white folks. Like, where, where is that movement? Where are the, like, you know, I, I'm appreciative of, of progressive folks who want to come in communities of color and be supportive, but I'm gonna need you to go out and mobilize your folks too, right? Because until there's a, a, a new understanding of the common malady that afflicts us all, you know, poor white folks, you know, or so-called working class white folks, which is a disingenuous term, or, or the working class, as if, you know, black and brown folks aren't working class. We're overwhelming majority of us are working class. But, uh, but somebody needs to be mobilizing them and educating and engaging them so they're not taken by the populism and rhetoric of a Donald Trump, right? Because it's, it's easy to make folks of color immigrants, the, the others, that, that they are the source um, for lower wages and for lack of, uh, of opportunity. And that's, and that's just not the reality. And, and that's the problem with white supremacy is that it impacts white people too. And, you know, and, um, and, and, and until folks are organizing in that space um, in a meaningful and robust way, um, we're, we're gonna, well, not until, but, um, I think it's also important for that organizing uh, to happen and to David to, to, to kind of, you know, you need a majority. Well, that, that's, that's part of the majority. Um, and, and to get folks to recognize that they have a self-interest in this as well. It's not just about feeling bad about what's happening to people of color and thinking that it's unjust, but, it, it's, it's, but it's also happening to them. And, and recognizing the harm that it inflicts on them and their lives and their communities, um, I think is also a, a, a supplement to, to following the lead of folks who are directly impacted. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, historically, obviously, I mean, this to Rada's point about, the, about capitalism and, you know, uh, you, know you know, those of us who, who, who know the history know that uh, in Reconstruction, there was a time and an opportunity for uh, free people and and poor whites to unify, you know, in the South. And 
and and the planters, you know, faithfully disrupted that by inserting whiteness uh, as a as a wedge, you know, and 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 there, this country has a capitalism itself has a way of of creating those wedges, you know. I mean, I do think that on some level, Rasan, you're talking about re what Reverend Barber is trying to do. I mean, you know, Reverend Barber is trying to do just that, um, you know, and, you know, but I, I don't know how much, <laughs> you know, how much, uh, you, you know, how much influence he's having in that regard. Um, but I wanted to come back to something that you mentioned Rasan, and I and I think it speaks to your work, uh, Radha, and, and that is the relationship between what we what we saw in the film and 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 wrongful convictions. I mean, I think there's you know I wonder about this system of 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 uh, uh, of, 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 of of policing, uh, and and you know and and Rasan, you mentioned Sean Ellis, and I know. Uh, uh, rather, you you do a, a lot of work in this space, and I wonder if you could speak to that in terms of the film and and, and the message that we should should absorb. There's a lot to say, I think. Um, but I think as a starting point, I think any system that weaponizes white supremacy means that any convictions that are a result of that are wrongful convictions. So I want to be very clear that um, there is no integrity in the system that leads to these convictions, and therefore they are all wrongful convictions as a result. Um, the scope of, you know, what what we do to free people who are in prison um, in the individual case, um, you know, we like Sean Ellis, who we didn't uh, help free him, but who is now, uh, you know, one of our trustees and is a leader in, in this community and in this space. Um, there are individuals whose lives have been lost because of corruption and lies and unreliable evidence. And because we defer to the police and say, if you tell me that he is guilty, I will believe you and I will take his life away. Whether that's because I let you do it by your hands or because I pay for him to be in prison for the rest of his life. And that's what we do here. All of those individual cases are, um, they're symptoms of a much bigger problem. Um, and we're not going to we're not going to get to the wrongful convictions by each individual case there sean always says there's so many sean ellises and unfortunately that's true um we couldn't possibly overturn every wrongful misdemeanor conviction we couldn't possibly overturn every wrongful felony conviction or every or every murder conviction um, the same resistance that it, that we that we were talking about earlier to just this idea about who are we, what what is America, what are we doing? Um, that's the resistance we face every time we go to court and say someone is innocent. We are told that cannot be not in our system, and what we have to prove to free people is so much more than anybody had to prove to detain them and lock them up and take away their lives and and destroy communities. Um, so that is the battle that we take on um, in community with the people who are harmed every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, I... I Again, I just think the, I mean, I, I really can't say more uh, than what Rada has already said. I, I just want to underscore, though, the, the role that policing plays in all this. It's, it's the feeder system, right? Because it begins when police are patrolling neighborhoods, stopping kids to just ask them questions, 
collecting their information in an FIO form or a field interrogation observation form and using that information and their associations and their so-called intelligence to make assessments that individuals are, are gang involved or the traffic or the speeding traps that they set up or the patrolling that they do in certain communities or the drug stings that they do uh, all as a means to justify their existence we're making the stops we're engaging the people to see if there is criminal conduct and even if there's no criminal conduct because of the laws that we have given them access to use anything can become criminal conduct an officer stops you in a motor vehicle for failing to signal everybody does that but who gets stopped for it and disproportionately so and then when you're pulled over and have the audacity to question why you're being stopped that results in an exit order or if you're scared for your life and your heart is beating and the officer starts to engage and ask question that results in an exit order and any resistance or refusal to that escalates the situation ultimately to the point where if somebody is too vocal they're being charged with disturbing the peace or disorderly conduct and then they're being arrested for those offenses and then when they try to say i shouldn't be arrested and pull away that is then resisting arrest and if in the scuffle to try to not be arrested for something that you didn't do the officer gets hurt you have now conducted an assault and battery on a police officer and those interaction those it's like death by a thousand cuts. And that type of policing creates a database of individuals from which law enforcement then uses to begin to investigate people for potential crimes. And if you have enough hits, and if your face is familiar enough, or you look like someone, or you were in some place at some time, that's enough information to put your, your name in play in the Russian roulette um, of of this criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't have a lot of time left here, but, and, and I, you know, I, you know, on some level, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged that we have left prosecutors out of this conversation um, in, in some ways, because they, they, they certainly play a significant role. But, but one of the things that I, I wanna to, to mention is that um, there are a couple of things. One is I think that, you know, that there is a lot of, there is legal work being done to start to try to chip away at some of these practices at this question of, you know, wh whether a person should reasonably be nervous if stopped and whether that's an indication, you know, that, that gives, gives a cause for further action. But there are other ways in which I think, you know, I think, Rasan, you mentioned, you know, kind of officers, you know, s s stand up in court and are, are accepted as experts, you know, when they'll say that a neighborhood is a that they had reason to believe because the neighborhood is a high crime neighborhood or an open air drug market and make these characterizations, not only about individuals, but about entire neighborhoods. And then, you know, that that's used as pretext for a particular activity and a particular form of control. And, you know, I think, you know, if we're going to start to think about changing the narrative, we really have to address that too. kind of what gets, what's allowed to be said in open court you know, uh, you know, how, you know, and because, because those characterizations seep into the news and everything else, so that so that, that the characterization of a neighborhood as high crime, even just the use of that term without its being specified, you know, um, really effectively uh, gives free play to the kind of policing you're talking about, Rasan. I mean, and and I think if we're going to shift narratives. We have to address that and kind of bias, a community bias uh, that, that we fight in, additional to, in addition to individual bias. And I think our communities are, um, are, are characterized as lesser than, as unsafe in some ways, and that's a real problem. So I'm sorry, that's, that, <laughs> but I think, you know, we have a little bit of time and, I, and, I, and I'm curious from each of you, uh, you know, you know, a kind of, if you can muster uh, an optimistic or positive thought about kind of how, how we move forward, how on this day of all days, right, um, 
uh, we recognize that this verdict doesn't vindicate a nation and doesn't change policing, but does it give us some idea, some hope? And if so, what, what, where do we go next? What do we do next? Either, either partic small particular thing or large global thing. I'll go first, or rather, can have the last word. That's appropriate. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll end where um, I, I started. I'm. I think we need to commit ourselves to abolition um, in earnest, uh, and that includes not only just talking about the ways to uh, dismantle this system by, you know, divesting from it defunding it, um, coming up with alternatives, but again, talking about the larger vision of the world that we want to live in that does not, uh, not only doesn't rely on police, but don't ha doesn't have police as a part of the equation because we will forever be stuck uh, in this conversation about public safety um, and, and including police. And so we need to um, really commit to educating ourselves about what abolition really is um, and working towards it. Uh, we also need to commit uh, to shifting the narrative. Um, and so documentaries like this one um, are, are a good starting place. And there are tons, right? The, the 13th and you know, in any number of, of films, when they see us, uh, that just again, begin to tell the story and just deconstruct the false notions of, of who we are as a country as defined by this criminal legal system. Um, and instead of the grief that I felt earlier and, and still feel now, I'll change that out um, for hope, uh, for, for hope in us as, uh, as a people um, specifically the most directly impacted people of this system, the victims of the criminal legal system, the folks who have not only been wrongfully convicted, but convicted, who have been prosecuted, who have been policed and harassed, poor people, people of color, black folks, Latinx folks, indigenous folks, um, gender non-conforming folks, the, the way that this system has treated us um, they should be uh, glad that we're not looking for revenge. Um, but, but I think I, I'm hopeful that as more people uh, who are directly impacted are, are uh, assuming leadership uh, positions, that the conversation continues uh, to be reframed as more people are, are public, um, uh, publishing uh, literature that talks about the reality of what this system is and what it does and where it comes from. And, you know, and the more platforms that we have available to share this information, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get there. So first, it's funny, David, that you ask for a hopeful end, another real American sign of how we need to end. Um, but to be fair, you know, I think that there is there is so much more that we can be doing. And I think in that sense, it is hopeful because we have not exhausted what there is. We have not exhausted our imagination and we've not exhausted our power. So I think that that is the number one hopeful thing. We are, um, we are people who are, who can come together and who can demand something that is different. We can also, you know, we are all in communities. We are in families, we are in communities. And when we hear people with a narrative that we all now know is false, we can have a conversation. We can stop that and we can share what we know. And we can do that over and over, multiply so that each of us are ambassadors of this knowledge and that we have that direct contact um, and that communication that we don't let the false narratives go by us, we stop them. And, uh, and I think that that does in a multiplying effect matters. We're also jurors, you know, we saw the power of jurors today. We are also voters. We are people who can 
go to our city council and tell them what we want with our tax dollars. We can do that. We should do that and we should do it together. And, you know, of course, there are those of us who are lawyers and just like Rasan said that police are feeders, but look at what happens after that. Yes, the police are the feeders. Then the prosecutors are the infrastructure, then the public defenders, then the judges, right? And then maybe the juries, but really it usually stops there because 90% of cases, more than 90%, you know, fall away there. And so the, the issue is, you know, some of us, and I know some of the folks who are watching here today are actually in some of those roles or know people who are in those roles. And it is our job to stop that narrative each and every day. It is this, it is our job to reprogram ourselves too, because it's embedded in us. It is, it's like water. It is in my four-year-old, right? These are from, you know, from when you, uh, these are the myths that we are given and that we hold and we have to discard them for something that is better. Um, and I think we can uh, because we haven't tried everything that we can. We haven't tried it together. Um, so I guess in that sense, I am hopeful. Um, well, thank you for digging deep and finding that hope. And to you, Rasan, I will say in, in closing, in 1857 with Dred Scott, I doubt that abolitionists thought they would see an end to slavery within eight years. And I think that we have to hold on to that and understand that, that abolition is possible if we do what Rod is saying. So, you know, on that note, Radha, I thank you so much for, 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 for thinking of showing this, for hosting this, and, and to both of you and to all of you who came, you know, I, I do hope uh, that in some ways it has helped us and, and will help us move forward and uh, collectively, and that, that this community uh, uh, is strong enough uh, to, to make real change. So thank, thank you everyone, Rada, uh, Rasan. And thank you, David, for really guiding us through this conversation, mm -hmm. especially tonight. Yeah, thank you, David. So, so I think I'm, it's, you're in control here, Radha, I think. Yes, so. <laughs> okay, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. And you will be able to watch this later for those who ask. Thank you so much. Bye.